In the 1998 cinematic treatise on neurobiology called The Water Boy, we got introduced to the medulla oblongata and the fact that it is what causes alligators to be foul-tempered and not, as the ancients foretold, because it has so many teeth and no toothbrush. Sorry if my 21-year-old movie reference is too fresh for all you yeets. The medulla oblongata is a thing, but it's not necessarily like the center of emotion or anything like that. It actually coordinates a lot of automatic stuff, uh, communicating between the brain and the spinal cord, some body movement functionality, that kind of thing, with just a little bit of regulation of mood. The movie was right, though, to associate that level of brainstem activity to an alligator, you know, a creature that evolved a long time before we did. Because that alligator-level brain, it never really went away through natural selection. It's still in there, in our brains. And it controls you in more ways than you think. We tend to think of ourselves as logical and reasonable people, and most of the time we are, despite every YouTube comment section in existence. But logic is actually a fairly new development in our evolution. There's actually something much deeper, much more primal, that controls us in ways that we don't really realize. Imagine the brain as sort of a Russian nesting doll containing three layers. This is known as the triune brain. It was first put forth by neuroscientist Paul McLean in the 1960s, and he argued that these three layers correspond to reptilian, paleomammalian, and neomammalian stages of evolution. But the reptilian complex, for example, controls more automatic and reflexive body functions like heart rate, breathing, balance, stuff kind of under the hood that you don't have to think about. This is obviously the oldest part of the brain. The newest part of the brain, the neomammalian complex, is the thinking brain, responsible for abstract thought and creativity. It also includes the prefrontal cortex, which is where a lot of our slow thinking takes place. And between these two is the paleomammalian complex, and this, well, this is the man behind the curtain. This is what really controls your life. This is known as the limbic system, and it controls basic functions and emotions like fear and anger, behaviors like the fight or flight reflex, and it also is the place where we store all of our memories. And while your prefrontal cortex obviously is the thing that's making all of your decisions, it's making these decisions based off of the memories and the processes that are happening inside your limbic system. You know, for instance, your high-level thinking brain might think it's completely irrational and illogical to throw a chair through a window, but if the limbic system was feeding information to that neocortex that, say, the room was on fire and that was the only way out, well, then throwing a chair through a window would make perfect rational sense. So you can imagine it as your reacting and feeling brain. For example, studies have shown that people who are angry are more likely to criticize other people, or if you're hungry, more likely to judge others. The whole hangry process in action. The limbic system is located underneath the cerebral cortex and above the brainstem and consists of several structures that interact with each other. The thalamus, the hypothalamus, the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The thalamus acts kind of like a gatekeeper or a relay station. All sensory information filters through it before going on to the cerebral cortex. Except smell, which is why you can catch a certain smell and be, you know, quickly transported to another place or emotion automatically. The thalamus also plays a role in memory storage plays a role in emotions, especially ones related to inspiration and pain. It also plays a part in sleep and wakefulness. Some even think it has a role in consciousness. The basal ganglia governs movement, especially habitual behavior, so the reason you don't have to think about how to draw out the shape of every letter when you're writing is because it's all controlled under the surface by the basal ganglia. Right in front of the thalamus is the hypothalamus. It regulates hormones and it's connected to the autonomic nervous system, which controls blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, digestion, and sexual response. Then we have the hippocampus, which plays a major role in the formation of memories. It also helps with spatial orientation and navigation. And finally, we arrive at the amygdala. Remember when I said there's something deeper and more primal when it comes to our decision making? Well, here we are. The amygdala plays a role in emotional response. Basically, anything that's important for your survival is handled through the amygdala. It's often associated with fear, and that's because back in the 1930s, uh, researchers actually removed the amygdala from the brains of some monkeys, and when they did that, they showed absolute fearlessness after that. But your amygdala plays a much bigger role than just fear. It's involved in social interactions, imagining the future, writing, eating, drinking, and remembering the past. There are some theories that say that it helps the brain to sort out ambiguity by associating different memories with different situations. The whole associating a bell with when you eat thing that we talked about in the Pavlov video. The point is the amygdala helps you to form memories and behaviors based around emotions. It's also possible that it plays a role in depression. Uh, there was a study that showed that when depressed people looked at pictures of angry faces or sad faces, um, their amygdala activity picked up in ways that non-depressed people didn't. But when viewing happy faces, there wasn't any difference between depressed people and non-depressed people in terms of their amygdala activity. 
One of the more interesting effects of the amygdala, at least according to some studies, is that it can actually sort of determine your political views. According to an MRI study of 90 young adults, people who describe themselves as conservatives seem to show more gray matter and more activity in their amygdala, especially their right amygdala, than did political liberals. And an fMRI study on risk taking showed that conservative people had more activity in their right amygdala as well. Kind of interesting that it's on the right amygdala. The association of political conservatism with the right amygdala, a structure that's bilaterally sensitive to emotional saliency, especially fear, suggests an increased processing of potential signals for threats, said Dr. Mario F. Mendez. In normal person speak, this means that somebody with an enlarged amygdala is going to be naturally more wired to kind of look for and react to threats. And this might explain why conservative people who typically have larger amygdalae focus more on security and safety and react more strongly to fear messaging. And there's also some interesting things that happen if the amygdala is damaged. For example, one study on the role of the amygdala in decision making said that it triggers autonomic responses to emotional stimuli, including monetary reward and punishment. But it found that people with damaged amygdalae lack the autonomic responses to reward and punishment and consequently cannot utilize somatic marker type cues to guide future decision making. In other words, if you have a damaged emotional center, you have a much harder time making decisions. So, you still think you're completely logical? In damage to the anterior temporal lobe, which plays a part in knowing facts and people and names and words and stuff like that, can lead to something called Kluver-Busey syndrome. This is a weird and rare condition that can cause people to compulsively put things in their mouths, do inappropriate sexual behaviors, lose any kind of fear, and not be able to recognize any objects. So if our emotions ultimately dictate our decisions and how we live our lives, what does this mean in a world that is increasingly being run by computer algorithms? In his interview with Joe Rogan, Elon Musk talked about how the internet is our collective limbic system, saying that all the things that we like and hate and fear, they're all there on the internet. And he also referred to limbic resonance, that the more engaging emotionally something is, the more attention it receives. AI and computers are all learning from this content and how we interact with that content and reframing the way we experience the world through that. Or as author and professor Derek DeKerkhove wrote in a 2015 paper, the internet has extended the influence of the limbic system of the individual body to the crowd. And that social media can be equated to the amygdala, which plays the role of the accelerator and determines the amount and size of emotional response to an event. This sounds dystopian. But he sees a future where this immediately accessible collective emotion could actually lead to a better world. Like imagine if the internet wasn't just a repository of information, but also a collective understanding of the emotions of the world, you know? Like you, you could use the internet obviously to find a place to eat and check the weather and all that, but you could also see how the world is feeling right now, you know? And, and you can determine what your particular responsibility for that condition is. Writes to Kirkhove, we have all kinds of bracelets that tell us about personal health. In the future, we'll have apps that keep us informed about the health of the world. And that might open up a whole new way of understanding ourselves. How do you feel about this? Does this sound logical to you? Does this get your emotions going? Talk about it in the comments. Also real quick, I know the holiday season is coming up, so I wanted to take a second and talk a little bit about the shirts and, and the, the merch that's available at the store. Now of all this time I've been saying to, for people to go to answerswithjoe.com shirts, you can still do that, but I have got a new uh, place for you to go. It's just answerswithjoe.com store because I felt like it's kind of, it's a lot more than just shirts on there. There's posters, there's stickers, there's mugs, there's all kinds of different things. So uh, you can have your pick of fun, nerdy things and Answers with Joe branded type stuff if you go to answerswithjoe.com store. I appreciate it. It helps support this channel and you'll get some cool stuff, maybe some gifts out of it. I also want to take a second to thank all the members of the channel on YouTube. I'm always thanking the Patreon people, but I don't want to forget you guys. There's like 150 or so people that are supporting the channel on YouTube. You can join them and you can get access to exclusive live streams, early access to videos and whatnot, just like the Patreon people do. Just hit the little join button down below and find out more. And if you're scrolling through the comments and somebody has a little like piece of my face next to it, a little logo or something like that, that's a member. So thank them for supporting the channel because they are better than you. All right, thanks a lot for watching this. If this is your first time here, uh, you might want to check this one out. The algorithm, in all of its wisdoms, thinks that you might like it. There's also other videos that are probably being recommended down here. I got my little face on them. I invite you to watch those, and if you like them, uh, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.